Okay. <clears throat> For my part, I've had uh, the time to prepare some slides which will make it a little easier to follow. And um, let me just uh, get this started. And uh, today we're reviewing the book God, Sky, and Land by uh, Brian Bull and Fritz Guy. Uh, God, Sky, and Land is, uh, the full title is Genesis 1 as the ancient Hebrews heard it, and that's a pretty good summary of, of what's intended. Um, Brian Bull, of course, is a, a chair of the Department of Pathology here at Loma Linda, and uh, has been a dean, and has been the editor-in-chief of blood cells, and is the, article, uh, is the author of 20, 200 scientific articles. And uh, Fritz Guy is research professor of philosophical theology at La Sierra University. Before that, he has been the university president, also a president, also a college dean, a church pastor, and has authored about 80 articles in the book Thinking Theologically. This is an attempt to get us back, at least this is my opinion of it, to the original meaning of Genesis and then to draw some conclusions. In the author's view, Genesis 1 doesn't address the questions we commonly ask of it. Uh, the most important creation is a hard metal dome over the earth to keep the waters of chaos out. Genesis 1, although in, in spite of that, is, an, is an authoritative on the fundamental issues and we'll see what they consider those issues to be. The foreword talks about the conflict over the Genesis creation accounts and seems to try not to take sides. It describes several different sides and then says, instead we proceed in a relatively unexplored direction that is in a manner of speaking at right angles to the range of interpretations outlined above. The first chapter talks about retro translation, which instead of bringing the book to you, tries to bring you back to the book. Um, it's very difficult to do. They then produce what they call the original hearer's version, or the OHV, and then explain the retro translation. There's one explanation that I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. The Toledoth, they say, is in fact not generations. It should be um, a count, and I agree with them on that. Um, uh, they give several reasons for that, and three of them are in the next uh, section, Hashemayim Arts, which echoes Genesis 1.1, the same language, sky, land, and brought into existence, and these form uh, verbal bookends to the story. Uh, a third reason for putting this particular passage with the first one is that Genesis 2-3 to three does not descri uh, describe the creation of the sky and the land, but it's rather creation of the first humans and then their disobedience. Um, and the fourth reason is that uh, the name Yahweh does not appear in Genesis 1. The reversed order of the land and sky and the lack of the definite article the with either land or sky uh, means that this starts a new account. So you split the verse right in the middle. And with that I agree. The authors discuss sky, land, and vault, noting for that for them, the authorship is irrelevant. We have different pictures in our minds than the first listeners. The difference is so great that we can seem to be living in significantly different intellectual universes. Um, Genesis 1 to them sounds like a carefully constructed hymn of six stanzas followed by a concluding final stanza, whereas Genesis 2 is a straightforward narrative without the structured repetition. There's a different order. I'm not going to get through in 10 minutes if I do. The, there's a different order of creation. There are different modes of creation. There are different names for God, and there are different initial conditions. Again, they're emphasized for getting the concepts that we have today and really listening and setting aside the world of the Hubble Space Telescope. Hashemaya means sky rather than heaven and their conception of sky is a firmament, a heavenly vault, something solid and protective over their heads, like an enormous inverted bowl. This is difficult to reproduce in today's world for one thing, 
We see stars at, at differing distances. The ancients wouldn't have seen that. They quote approvingly Harper's Dictionary of the Bible. The ancient Hebrews imagined the world as flat and round, covered by the great solid dome that was held up by mountain pillars. Above the dome and under the earth was water divided by God at creation. The upper waters were joined with the waters of the primordial deep during the flood. The ruins were believed to fall through the windows of the firmament. The rains, I'm sorry, were believed to fall through the windows of the firmament. The sun, moon, and stars moved across or were fixed in the firmament. Within the earth lay Sheol, the realm of the dead. And then they describe, uh, in their own words, the same basic concept. A disc of wood covered with cork and painted green makes a promising start. Uh, it fits just within the hemispherical bowl. Um, for those who listened to Genesis 1, it was in this way that the waters of chaos above were held away from the land, which was thus sheltered and, pro and protected within our inverted bowl. They go on to discuss the vault, the rakia. Um, which was translated stereoma, something solid in Greek, and uh, firmamentum in the Latin Vulgate, which in indicates something firm. It's cognate to raca, which is to beat out, and they give some examples. The vault is joined at the hip to the sky, and um, if you uh, Genesis 1 is divided in form, into form and function. The first three days are form and the second three days are function or sometimes known as filling. Um, only later is the sky mentioned by itself. Um, well, except for the first verse. And um, the, uh, if you combine the vault and the sky, they tie with land for second place in the number of words used. God is first. Uh, the reason why is that what was described here was something that could protect the created reality from the waters of chaos above. Without that, the rest of creation would be useless. In introducing the vault, the author of Genesis 1 emphasized by reiteration the fact that it served a vitally important function separating the waters. In order to serve this function, the vault had to have some substance, some solidity, some heft to it. Greek thinkers had a remarkably modern view, but this, uh, these ideas eventually lost out to the common sense view that the earth was stationary and it was the heavens that moved. Um, they discuss uh, modern translations and then they move into what do we do with all of this? Uh, they have a model, uh, they suggest a model of, of verbal inspiration, but they say that won't work. Uh, they substitute a more complex process, which allows for incorrect concepts. Um, one of the examples they use is the author of Leviticus listing bats among the unclean birds that were not to be eaten, but we all know the bats are mammals, not birds. The authors disparage the separation of theology and historical scientific elements. Um, there's another concept that they discuss, and they say the problem with both of these approaches is they assume that because the category of pre-scientific, historical scientific, and theological are present in our minds today, they were also present in the minds of the author of Genesis 1. They think this is very unlikely. Uh, the ancients had no law of nature and therefore no miracles. Nothing just happened. It was either humans or God. Now, they go on to talk more about miracles. They talk about explanicepts. Presumably that's explanatory concepts, which now include natural law and chance, but did not then. So we have some that we just have to forget if we're going to be reading that. The difference in explanatives is our biggest obstacle in re-entering the world of Genesis 1 and hearing its narrative of creation the same way the original hearers heard it. And although other problems may be gotten around, the rakia is a problem that nothing can mask. Genesis 1 was understood as theology and as a true narrative of how, by the activity of God, everything came into existence. And then they have this rather surprising statement. It was and still is the inspired, true, and essential account of what happened in the beginning. Rakia and all, I guess. Um, <coughs> they criticized the old earth, young life view. The sky and the land is not the modern universe. 
um, which actually I agree with. Uh, the Hubble telescope made a profound difference. And this picture of the vault of the sky survived with only minor changes until as late as 500 years ago, if you believe uh, Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon. They disparage the gap theories. They say it's unreasonable to make scientific demands on the Genesis account. And I guess I'm done with my 10 minutes, so I'm going to cut it off from the next bunch. Um, what Genesis 1 really says to us is, one, we need to worship God. Two, God is responsible for everything. Three, we're made in the image of God. Four, nature is coherent. Five, divine generosity, not competition or chance. I like that one. And six, humanity has a vocation, which is given in Genesis 2. Days for the Hebrew, early Hebrew started in the morning, according to the anchor Bible commentaries. And Genesis 1 was different. And uh, the reason why is evening was bad, morning is good. These are fulfillment days. Not clear from reading the book whether they uh, think they are intended to be literal. Um, they talk about literal or figurative language, and then they bring in the setting of science. And they say, can, if you don't believe uh, science here, can science be trusted anywhere? And uh, they cite understanding creation, but they say it doesn't solve the problems. They talk about evolution in Genesis. They note that there are three different kinds of definitions of evolution. One, long times. Two, random mutation and natural selection. And three, there's no God needed. They disagree with the uh, meaning three. Uh, they say Genesis 1 doesn't say anything about meanings 1 or 2. And they finish with saying theology and science are different language games. Now, that's a whirlwind study. Now for the critique, I was really kind of disappointed. It was a great idea, but translating Ulf as birds, uh, Ulf is literally wings. If you're going to go back to the ancient times, you have to think of winged creatures, which means that one of the objections that is made, that, uh, that uh, bats are not birds. Well, bats may not be birds, but they're certainly winged creatures. Um, Haita was from the Hebrew yehi, a past tense of the common irregular Hebrew verb haya to be. Oh, haya is he was literally. Haita is she was. They're the exact same form except male or female. The earth is female, and um, yehi is the future, as in yehi or there will be light. Waikolu waikal, from the Hebrew irregular verb yakal, complete finish. The Hebrew verbs in the two sentences are in fact identical. They're different tenses, they're different numbers. The translation of Rakia's expanse going back at least to the Young's Literal Testament, 1862, and repairing the NSB, NIV, ESV, and NET, has no linguistic justification and may be theologically motivated. Then you read a little further. The Rakia is not used in the sense of atmospheric expanse by any Bible writer unless one counts the birds flying across the face of the vault of the sky. Well, maybe there is a little linguistic uh, justification for it after all. The question I have is why are non-experts who do not do their homework on a translation, or at least all of their homework, making the original hearer's version and making statements with no linguistic justification? Could it be uh, theologically motivated? Now, I want to say here, I don't think theological motivation is a bad thing. But I think we need to be careful about throwing around things when we're guilty of the same. If you summarize the book, the vault is the most important concept of Genesis 1. The vault is unbelievable to us moderns. We need to avoid using Genesis in a, quote, historical scientific, end quote, way. I have a problem with that anyway, 
because to me, history is not always scientific. I don't think the Red Sea is a scientific problem. Um, and this is because of the pressure of modern, of modern science, mentioned both in the foreword and at the end of the book. Uh, bias is evident right from the foreword. The authors don't cite any short age sources in the foreword, but they cite numerous long age sources. They defend long age positions as being Christian and tell us to ignore such people as Richard Dawkins, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. They quote a favorite passage from Ellen White without any hint that she had much to say about this particular topic that strongly disagrees with what they have to say. Now, bias is not necessarily wrong, but I think it is better to acknowledge evidence for the other side. I find an inconsistency in the presentation. The rakia is central. We have to believe the rakia as a solid bowl, even if we can't believe that today. But we fudge in the days. Who knows what they really meant? Why not just say that the days are roughly 24-hour periods involving an evening and a morning? If they're wrong, then treat them like the rakia. The translation of Rakia as an expanse goes going back to at least to the Young's Literal Testament, 1862. Well, they forgot somebody. Santis Pagnino, Vetris et Novi Testamenti, Novo Translatio, 1527. Rakia is consistently translated as expansionem. I don't think I need to expand on that. By the way, Copernicus' book was written in 1543. So Pagnino could not have been defending the Copernican position, let alone the Newtonian one, which is really the one, because Copernicus still had spheres. Let us suppose that there is a bowl. Well, either the stars move in the bowl or the bowl moves, and anybody can see that, could see it way back when. The stars move across the sky at night. They seem to opt for the bowls moving, and I agree with them. That means that the bowl is not actually a bowl, it's a sphere. The sun, moon, and planets move across the sphere in addition to the sphere's own movements. So we've got spheres inside of spheres or something like that, at least objects inside of spheres, and then the clouds are below all of that. And this is things that people, ancient people could figure out. Um, the clouds were known to cause the rain, and there's lots of texts that speak about that. The windows of heaven, are not the windows of the rakia, which is interesting. And they're found in three different places. Genesis 7, 11, and 8, 2, the flood story, the windows of heaven were opened and the water poured in. Yes, that's true. The other two places, interestingly, are where blessings poured through. One of grain, if God opened the windows of heaven, could this happen? And the other one of Malachi 3.10, I will pour you out a blessing so there's not room enough to receive it. So when the windows of heaven are open, it isn't the, uh, the waters of chaos that come down all the time. It's what God wants to have come down. There are lots of texts saying God stretches out the heavens like a tent. And uh, that doesn't sound like a hard bowl. And I don't have time to go into the rakia itself, although perhaps maybe another time we can go into the, the actual verbal stuff. There's some very interesting passages there. And uh, there is linguistic shifts that take place, and uh, the best way of showing that is uh, the verb biom itself, in the day, which came to mean when. Well, where does this idea of a flat earth with a bowl come from? It actually comes from the early Middle Ages, like Tantius. And the Cosmos Indicoplustus picked it up. These are about the only people, these are certainly the only people that wrote extensively about it. Aristotle, in fact, believed in a round earth, as did Ptolemy, Thomas Aquinas, and virtually all the educated people of the Middle Ages. Augustine, Basil, you name it. The flat earth, in fact, was an object of ridicule. Let me just give you a passage, for it is not unknown that Lactantius, otherwise an illustrious writer, but hardly an astronomer, he was very good at Latin, by the way, uh, speaks chi quite childishly about the Earth's shape when he mocks those who declare that the Earth has the form of a globe. And my opponents are just like him. Obviously, the person who wrote this knew 
that Lactantius was not taken seriously. Who was that person? Well, it was actually Nicolaus, Nicolaus Copernicus, 1543. The revolution of Bus Orbium Colestium. That's the Rosen's translation. And uh, this was picked up by William Hull, Washington Irving, uh, who extended it to the whole Council of Salamanca, Antoine Jean Latron, and it just, the, the story got bigger and bigger and bigger. John Draper and Andrew Dixon White, who wrote about the warfare between science and Christianity. It's got backdated to the Babylonians. Sorry, I'm going to have one more minute and then I'm going to uh, yield the floor. Lambert W.G., The Cosmology of Sumer and Babylon in Ancient Cosmology, says, the idea of a vault of heaven is not based on any piece of evidence for the Babylonians. P. Jensen simply translated the Babylonian word for heaven in Enuma Elish by vault of heaven and thereafter assumes that the point is proved. I'd finish by taking a quote from the, the book God, Sky, and Land. However, before we sprain our elbows and patting ourselves on the back, we should remember that our information concepts and understandings too are limited and that there is much, much more to learn. Our present understandings of the universe will almost certainly seem as strange to our successors of the world view of, as the worldview of Genesis 1 seems to us. I would submit that in some cases our understandings of history may suffer the same fate. And uh, with that, I'll turn the uh, program over to you. And let me just get this back to there. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, Paul. That was a whirlwind tour, even though I um, know pretty much what the book says. I was lost. You were going so fast at some places. What I would like to do, and then I'm going to turn the time over to Fritz for what he would like to do, is to um, take the first seven or eight minutes and uh, give a brief um, summary of what we think the book why we undertook the book project. And then we'll deal with them, as many of Paul's uh, questions as we can in the time allotted. So I think I can do no better than to read for you the preface to the book. It'll take me about a minute and a half. The foreword to the book, The Apparent Disconnect, Genesis versus Science. For almost 2,000 years, Christians have pored over the biblical text which is exactly what we're doing here today. In an earnest effort to understand them, the greatest minds of the church have spent themselves in this consecrated endeavor. Not the least of their concerns has been what the Bible teaches about creation. For this they turned, especially to Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. And studies of the six days loom large among the writings they have left us. We wish it were otherwise. But there's no getting around the fact that there is a profound disconnect between science, as it is commonly understood today, and Genesis, as it is usually read. A disconnect that has existed since the time scientific revolution began in the 16th century. This book is about Genesis 1, or more specifically Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 4a. And uh, Paul explained why we split the first and the second story of Genesis at that point. An abundance of evidence, some of which can be seen by non-scientists with their own eyes, if they, if they look in the appropriate places, indicates that the Earth is very, very old and that life upon it has been changing gradually for a long, long time, maybe billions of years. On the other hand, the biblical genealogies, together with the creation hymn in Genesis 1, suggest to many readers that the earth is something less than 10,000 years old and that all life forms came into existence in six literal 24-hour consecutive contiguous days during the same week in which earth itself was created. The gulf between these two views could hardly be larger. Yet many other readers, including Christian laypersons, theologians, and Bible-believing church-going scientists, are convinced that there must be a way to accept both modern science and Genesis 1. After all, is not one God the ultimate source of everything that is, including energy, matter, life, 
consciousness, and spirituality. For the several hundred years that the apparent disconnect between Genesis and science has persisted, there have been two main camps. Christians of a more conservative outlook have insisted that the controversy will be settled ultimately in favor of a literal understanding of the Genesis account. While science may, for the time being, not be supportive of this view, science often changes its opinions, these Christians say, and it will eventually come around to a short chronology both for Earth and for life upon it. But many practicing Christians who are also practicing scientists disagree. For more than 300 years, they have watched evidence accumulate that the Earth is billions of years old, that the universe is even older by something like nine billion years, and that living things have long inhabited Earth in ever-changing forms. Convinced by the weight of evidence from cosmology and astrophysics, biology and paleontology, geology and geochronology, genetics and genomics, they have concluded that the Genesis story must be figurative and non-literal, that it must be poetry, metaphor, or myth. So this seems to be the present situation. For many Christians, science is a weak read and inspired scripture is the only reliable authority on the age of the earth and the origin of life upon it. For most scientists, the Genesis story is at odds with overwhelming empirical evidence and must therefore have some other purpose than a description of how the reality we encounter in the physical world came into existence. Given that this theology versus science controversy pits two disciplines against each other, and that, not surprisingly, each discipline considers its own evidence conclusive and the other evidence illusory, it is understandable that the controversy shows little signs of abating any time soon. We have adopted neither of these stereotypical positions in this book, nor do we expound an intermediate position such as a gap theory, a day-age approach, or progressive creation. Instead, we proceed in a relatively unexplained direction that is, in a manner of speaking, at right angles to the range of interpretations outlined above. As a result, the nature of this book and the direction in which it proceeds requires some additional explanation which we provide. Our intention in writing this book is to recreate what the first Hebrew audience heard when Genesis 1 was read or more likely recited to them. We are convinced that what we hear now is profoundly different from what they heard then. We are further convinced that it is well worth the effort to explore some of the reasons why this is the case. This exploration has been initiated in part by some distinctly Adventist advice from nearly 120 years ago. There is no excuse for anyone in taking the position that there is no more truth to be revealed and that all our expositions of scripture are without an error. The fact that certain doctrines have been held as truth for many years by our people is not a proof that our ideas are infallible. Age will not make error into truth and truth can afford to be fair. No true doctrine will lose anything by close investigation. The second introductory uh, comment is uh, one that Fritz is going, to, is going to handle. And what he is going to do is to read what is essentially the first chapter of the book, the retro translation of Genesis chapter 1 with which the book begins and which leads to all of the questions that uh, have been advanced. I would like to, uh, before I read the translation, I would like to offer a paraphrase of the quotation from our friend Ellen that, um, and she is our friend, uh, that uh, Ryan read a couple of, a few seconds ago in fact, uh, and let's uh, think of it this way. Let us in imagination go back to that scene and as we sit with ancient Hebrews around a campfire, enter into the thoughts and feelings that filled their hearts. Understanding what the words of Genesis 1 meant to those who first heard them, we may discern in them a new vividness and beauty, and may also gather for ourselves their deeper lessons. Now, uh, depending on how new agey you are, you might like to close your eyes and imagine yourself um, 3,000 years, more or less, ago uh, listening to this account 
of the origin of things. To begin with, God brought the sky and the land into existence. Now, as for the land, it was formless and futile. Darkness covered the water, and God's spirit hovered over the surface of the abyss. God said, let there be light. Light came to be, and God saw that the light fulfilled his purpose. God separated the light from the darkness and named the light day and the darkness night. There was evening, then dawning, one creation day. God said, let there be a dome within the water and let it separate the water. God made the dome and separated the water under the dome from the water above the dome, and thus it came to be. God named the dome sky. There was evening, then dawning, a second creation day. God said, let the water beneath the sky be collected in one place so the dry ground will appear, and thus it came to be. God named the dry ground land and the collected water sea. God saw that it fulfilled his purpose. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, plants bearing seed and trees with seed bearing fruit, and thus it came to be. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed and trees with seed bearing fruit, and God saw that it fulfilled his purpose. There was evening, then dawning, a third creation day. God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to distinguish the day from the night. Let them function as signs for designated times, for days and for years, and let them function as lights in the dome of the sky to light up the land. And thus it came to be. God made two great lights, the larger light to dominate the day, the smaller light to dominate the night, as well as the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to light up the land, to dominate the day and the night, to separate the light from darkness. And God saw that it fulfilled his purpose. There was evening, then dawning, a fourth creation day. God said, let the water produce lots of living creatures and birds that will fly across the face of the dome of the sky. God brought the great sea monsters into existence and all kinds of living, moving creatures that the water produces in abundance and all kinds of birds. God saw that it fulfilled his purpose. God blessed them. Be fruitful and multiply and fill all the seeds. Let the birds multiply on the land. There was evening, then dawning, a fifth creation day. God said, let the land produce all kinds of living creatures, domestic animals, crawling things, and wild animals, and thus it came to be. God made the different kinds of wild and domestic animals and all kinds of crawling things, and God saw that it fulfilled his purpose. God said, let's make a human in our image, like us, to be in charge of the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the wild animals, the farm animals, as well as all the crawling things. So God brought the human into existence in his image, in God's own image, male and female. God blessed them and told them, be fruitful and multiply, till and tame the land. Take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living creature that moves on the land. And God said, look, I've given you for food every seed-bearing plant on the face of the land and every fruit-bearing tree. And I've given the green plants for food to every wild beast, bird, and living crawling creature. And thus it came to be. God observed everything he had made and saw that it indeed fulfilled his purpose very well. There was evening, then dawning, the sixth creation day. With that, the sky and the land were completed with all their vast array. God completed his work on the seventh day, and on the seventh day he rested. And because he rested on the seventh day from all of his creation work, 
God blessed the seventh day and made it sacred. This is how the sky and the land were brought into existence. Oh, you want to hand out the translation? For those of you who would like to um, follow along with the text that um, Fritz just read to you, we have the translation, the retro translation of um, Genesis 1 here. And we call it a retro translation for the reasons that Paul already mentioned, and that mm -hmm. is that what the attempt is here is to use only English words that would not conjure up in our minds pictures that could not have been conjured up in the minds of the first listeners. And that's difficult to do, and it required us to eliminate the use of certain words. Earth, for instance, because in a cosmological context, Earth to us means a planet. They didn't know they lived on a planet. They didn't know what a planet was, and nobody would have known for a thousand years. So although this sounds like a paraphrase, it isn't. It is the most literal translation of Genesis chapter 1, probably, that you've ever heard. Every single Hebrew word has been rendered into English, and in, on the rare occasion where we've had to add a word to make the uh, sentence make sense, it's in, included in square brackets so that you can see where the added words uh, come in. But it's a very literal translation of the Hebrew. And the only difference between this one and the ones that you're used to reading is that we have studiously avoided words like heavens, which to us mean universe or starry heavens, words like earth, which to us mean a planet. And instead, we've substituted words that are equivalent, but uh, are words that don't conjure up those sorts of pictures. With that as an introduction, um, I want to, want to give one footnote to the uh, text you have. Uh, this I mistakenly uh, copied from an earlier version, and since after this particular text was uh, typed by me, uh, we uh, changed the word dome to vault, and I believe every instance, uh, for reasons that just uh, that Brian just mentioned, namely that uh, it appeared to us that vault was perhaps a well. Let's put it that the other way. Dome was perhaps uh, a term that would not have been immediately in the minds of uh, the listeners uh, as they heard the word uh, rakia. Now, if we want to talk more about the word rakia, uh, it is interesting that the New International Version, which was first published in 1974, uh, used the old term expanse, uh, which, and thank you, Paul, for getting us back to some uh, Latin translations, uh, that it, uh, the NIV popularized the word expanse. It is perhaps therefore significant that in the 2011 edition of the New International Version, which is the one you will find in your friendly neighborhood uh, book and Bible store, um, the translation has been changed to vault, and uh, that may be uh, significant. Uh, why it was expanse in the first place, uh, we don't know. As uh, Paul has indicated, it's always precarious to uh, suggest motives for other people. Uh, we don't know why it was translated expanse in the first place. We don't know why it was changed to vault. Uh, last year, but there it is. And let me read that. Uh, this is the uh, New International Version 2011. The Pew Bible, by the way, in the University Church is the NIV also. It isn't this one. 
it's the immediately preceding one, which is called today's. Today's that's right, TNIV. TNIV, and that too um, reverted in the translation of Rakia to Vault. But let me read you Genesis 1:3 from the 2011 version. God said, "This is uh, beginning with verse six. Let there be a vault." between the waters to separate water from water. I can hear myself saying water the way English people say it instead of the way American people say it. <laughs> Sorry. Water. <laughs> <laughs> and God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate, uh, I'll give up, separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. And God called the vault sky. This is the way, this is the point in the text where the trans, uh, where the, the term rakia uh, becomes the term shemayim. Uh, and the uh, Hebrew author has made them equivalent. He says that the vault he called sky. Now if you look at the text, it looks very much as though, and here I'm, I'm interpolating my own impression, that the narrator from being outside what was going on has now moved inside this newly created vault and is looking up, and what he sees of the inside of the vault is called sky. But Paul mentioned the fact that in the book, and this is very true, although we don't think it's the most important thing in the book. Um, I'll come back to what we wrote the book about. But the vault is mentioned uh, on several occasions because it's one of the most prominent occasions in which the translators have, if you will, in many instances, welched. What they have done is they have said, this is what the text says. We know what it should have said. And as a consequence, we're going to translate it that way. Uh, we can give you three or four other instances where that occurs in Genesis chapter 1, if you're interested. And that's why when most people say, I read the text literally, they don't. Because the translators have made that very difficult or impossible unless you happen to be able to read Hebrew. So, vault. Um, is, is the most appropriate translation for Rakia. It is the commonest translation. The firmamentum is, um, is what's translated firmament. It got into the King James and therefore has gotten into um, our understanding of vault. But um, what has happened to us in the modern age is that we have, we, we look right through this particular segment of Genesis chapter 1. When we were in the process of putting this book together, um, I did, um, I'm a scientist, so I do studies, and I do control groups, and I do experimental groups. I asked a whole lot of people who are very knowledgeable about matters biblical, what is the commonest noun used in the first 20 verses of Genesis when the cosmological description is going on? I tried people in three different countries, People who can, who can actually recite Genesis from memory, on, on no occasion did one of those people pick firmament or vault. And the reason, I think, is that psychologically, we don't know what to do with it. And so we just simply obliterated it from our minds, and we don't see it. We literally read Genesis and don't see that word. Now, it's true, and this is what you cited. When you count the number of instances and you equate sky with vault, as, and I just quoted for you from Genesis, where, God, where the Genesis writer says the vault he called sky, then it is the most common noun throughout uh, the first segment of Genesis where forming is, is at issue. But even if you don't do that and you limit yourself to the cosmological portion, when when um, things are being created. So uh, it's fair, I think, to say that if it's the second most commonly used noun, the first being God, as, as uh, you mentioned and as we point out, then Genesis, to begin with, is about God and the vault. And we don't even see the vault anymore. So I think that it is, um, it is critical that we look at Rakia, we look at the history of the way it's been translated, and yes, translators have the same problem we do. 
they don't know what to do or didn't know what to do with this, this dome, and so they translated it something that they could feel more comfortable with. And expanse is, is nonspecific enough, and of course it very quickly becomes atmospheric expanse, so we have God creating the atmosphere. And rakia, under no circumstances, can be made to mean atmosphere, in my opinion. I would like to uh, add a minor footnote uh, to a previous footnote. Uh, <clears throat> should anyone care, and this perhaps reflects uh, the narcissism that's characteristic of me, won't bring Brian into this, uh, we did not change the word from dome to vault because of the uh, shift in the New International Version. Uh, indeed, when our book was published uh, last, late last summer, uh, we had, were not aware of this version, and we're quite sure that the translators of the NIV revision uh, did not do that because of our book. Uh, we have no reason to suppose that. They should have, though. They should have. Well, <laughs> had, they, had they read mm -hmm. it, they might have. Had they read it, they, it might have confirmed what they were going to do anyway. We think that what happened is the translators uh, got so much static from the uh, textual critics that they eventually had to revert back to vault instead of translating it as expanse. That might be the higher critics rather than the textual critics. But yeah, I think it would be the text critics, probably. No, the text has to do with what the, <coughs> what the actual verbiage uh, is. Mm. And, the, and uh, once you but get beyond that, you're talking, talking about higher right, criticism. Right, but, but, but it may have been from evangelical biblical scholars. It may have. Who, who simply uh, read uh, the Hebrew text and said, no way you can get expanse uh, out of rakia unless you're taking the notion of to beat out uh, as a kind of expansion. But our, the English word expanse uh, doesn't convey the, uh, the kind of solidity, firmness that the Hebrew verb and noun uh, seem, seem to convey uh, in the Old Testament. Maybe uh, I can ask, if you were doing it again, would you use winged creatures rather than birds? Oh. Uh, Probably so. Uh, indeed, uh, the, the Hebrew word of that, that you mention uh, includes uh, not only bats, but bees and butterflies and uh, anything, anything with wings, anything that flies. But it does make the point we were trying to make uh, in the book that the ancients didn't have the kind of specificity in their language and probably, this is my interpretation of that linguistic phenomenon, probably not in their thinking that we make. I mean, we have specialized in, well, even as we have done in medicine, for example. You know, we have specialties and subspecialties and sub-subspecialties. And we um, make up new words for them <coughs> because we don't have enough English words, and that's hard to do in Hebrew. <laughs> yes. In fact, yes. since Hebrew the, isn't our language. Yeah. What they usually will do is if they have to do something complicated like that, they'll string two or three words together, very much like uh, Chinese will do. But anyway, yes. Or uh, like German will do. <laughs> Jam. Yes. Uh, and... Uh, I'll refrain from mentioning other places where we uh, think we might have done a better job in the translation. Uh, no translation is perfect. It cannot be perfect simply because uh, languages are different and don't have exact equivalents uh, word for word. And that's why, uh, for example, jokes always fall flat in another language, uh, they just, they're so often Some jokes pun. do. Some Other jokes do. don't. But, but many jokes are puns. Yes. And the puns don't work <laughs> when translated. And on occasion, you have the happy coincidence where pneuma in Greek is both wind and spirit, but so is ruach in Hebrew. Yes. One, one more response to a question that Paul raised, and then um, we'll go into, I guess, the, um, the general discussion, or you have... Well, I have one other thing that I might uh, just uh, th throw at you and see what your okay. reaction to well, it is. Well, I'd like to deal with the question you raised about the flat earth. 
Um, the, the book that you uh, carefully and thoughtfully provided for us to check out, um, fortunately, I had in my library, so I didn't have to rush out and buy it. Um, and uh, it makes a very good case for the fact that um, the, uh, the whole notion of a flat Earth was unknown to Columbus and that there is very, very little possibility that he and his sailors worried about falling off the edge. And Columbus's voyage was not to disprove the notion of the flat Earth. Um, Columbus actually, for, um, as this book points out, he fudged on his figures. In order to get money, and the people who need grants sometimes <laughs> do this. Oops, I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> In order to get money for his voyage, he fudged on the figures something fierce, and he made the diameter of the round Earth, because he knew it was round, a lot smaller than it really was. And he made the Earth uh, portion of it a lot bigger than it yes, was. Yeah, <laughs> but he did all sorts of things. <laughs> but ever since then, researchers have been honest with their data. <laughs> anyway, uh, the notion of a flat Earth um, was, in fact, um, uh, gone by the time of the Greeks amongst the scholarly people. And it spread to the, the general populace, certainly by the time uh, of Greece, so the later Greece and Rome. Um, I was traveling in England not too long ago and went to the Roman baths. And they have a museum there, and they have carvings from the, from the Roman period. And they clearly have spherical earths there. Um, so they, the question was not flat earth versus round earth at the time of Galileo. The question was, which moved? Was it the earth that moved or the sun that moved? That was the argument with the, uh, with the church fathers. And that's what got Galileo into trouble. And that's in the book we quote from... Uh, Luther and Melanchthon, uh, 1550 or 1560, it's quite clear that the reformers still believed in a firmament that turned around the earth carrying the sun and the moon because they explicitly say so. And this is mid-1500s. So it wasn't flat earth or, or round earth that was the issue. It was which one moved. Right. Um, did you have anything to add, or shall well, we? Well, uh, yeah, let me just uh, quickly, um, and very, very quickly, uh, do a, a kind of uh, overview of pictures of the world. Uh, one can identify half a dozen of them. Uh, there is the Hebrew world uh, that is perhaps reflected in the Second Commandment, which talks about the heavens above, the earth beneath, and the waters under the earth. That has sometimes been uh, referred to as a three-level or three-story world. Um, there was the, subsequent to that, there was the Aristotelian world, which consisted of a number of concentric spheres with the earth at the center. Maybe that our hymn, This is My Father's World, and to my listening ears, you know, the music of the spheres, that may be an unconscious uh, reflection of this Aristotelian view. Uh, anyway, Aristotle had in particular uh, two main levels, the superlunary, that is above the moon, and the sublunary, sometimes pronounced sublunary, uh, that was below the moon, and the, in the uh, sphere, the area above the moon, uh, motion was circular. Below the moon, it was straight. Uh, ultimately, all motion was caused by God, the prime mover, uh, through, who through, this is Aristotle, not me, uh, who through a kind of subsidiary gods uh, had the outside sphere moving, and then that movement transmitted movement to the uh, lesser inner spheres. Uh, the outside sphere, which contained the fixed stars, was a perfect sphere. Now, very short, well, even before Aristotle, there were some views that I have called proto-modern, because they didn't survive, but they were very interesting. The Pythagoreans 
made the suggestion that the earth moved. Uh, that was in the 5th century uh, BCE. Uh, the next century, Heraclides, not to be confused with Heraclitus, uh, Heraclides, a student of Plato, suggested that the earth turned daily on its axis, and that's why the stars looked like they moved. Uh, very shortly, well, in the next century, Aristarchus said the planets and the earth all moved around the sun. This is third century BC. That's basically Copernicus's theory. Yes, yes. Uh, Aristosthenes, uh, later in the third century, calculated the circumference of the earth at, uh, he, he was working off the uh, different shadows of, of the sun in different places on the earth at the same time and uh, though it's hard to know what his numbers meant uh, some have suggested that he came within five percent of the actual circumference of the earth one, now, one of the one of the numbers that's thrown around is 24,000 miles which considering that it's really 24,700 is, is not, not bad, bad. <laughs> not bad uh, yeah but he made two mistakes in his calculations fortunately they uh, they contravened each other they corrected for <laughs> each other and so occasionally a researcher has the good fortune to make two mistakes which brings him out to the correct answer anyway <laughs> so but you can't count on it <laughs> yeah. uh, but the prop you know you may say well my uh, you know this was known well it was thought and by I'm sure the thinkers it was known but it, this view, these what I call these proto-modern views, uh, were rejected for some fairly good reasons, a good meaning plausible reasons. Certainly in their time they were plausible. Yeah, I mean, you know, just go outside and look. I mean, your senses tell you that the sun Is going up comes and up moving in the around. east and goes over and goes down in the west. I mean, what could be more obvious? Besides, if... More than that, if you drop an, uh, drop an arrow, it goes down. Yes. Why shouldn't it, if we're moving, why shouldn't it go... That's, that's right. Why doesn't, er indeed, why don't the birds and the clouds all fly away because of centrifugal force? Uh, I mean, this idea that the earth is spinning round and round, and besides that, going around the sun, I mean, that's just goofy. I, you know, mad scientists, I guess. Anyway, the mad scientists lost in the popular view of reality, which is why some otherwise quite intelligent people, Luther, Luther, <laughs> Melanchthon, uh, just went with the common sense view, uh, the prevailing popular view, conventional wisdom, and thought uh, Copernicus was, uh, what did they call him? Not too bright anyway. No, something about mischievous. Uh, besides that, one other thing that's probably important to keep in mind since we're doing cosmological history here is that Copernicus's view ain't nothing like ours. For him, the sun was the center of the universe. We think the sun is a kind of third-rate planet in a sort of ordinary galaxy that we call the Milky Way. Y you uh, mean star. Star. Star, I'm sorry. You said yeah. planet. No, no, star. Uh, thank you. Uh, and we have uh, a view of the size of the universe, the number of objects, uh, let's say astronomical objects. I think we mentioned in the book 100 million, 100 billion galaxies, each with maybe a hundred billion stars and maybe as many planets as stars. I mean, Can't uh, see those yet though. No, that, that's an uh, uh, educated guess. And of course we think of the, um, the universe as very, very old. And this may be the place to mention a shift that some of you have experienced and some of you are too young to have experienced. Until about the mid-60s, almost all educated Adventists 
believed that the whole astronomical universe came into existence a few thousand years ago. Now the view of the people across the street at the uh, Geoscience uh, Research Center and in Silver Spring at the uh, Biblical Research Center, uh, they seem to think that the universe is very, very old, you know, 13.7 billion years. Uh, that, that's a view that is not historic Adventism, if by historic you mean something before the 1960s. Now, for some of you, uh, there wasn't anything before the 1960s, or it didn't matter <laughs> anyway. Uh, but for some of us old geezers uh, who remember the shift and were, don't want to say traumatized, but were surprised uh, by this new view uh, that has now become quite standard, although probably if you took a poll of the 16 million Adventists, is that the number? 16, 17 million, something like that, around the world, probably a majority, a substantial majority, would still go for the whole universe uh, coming into existence a few thousand years ago. Now, I'm going to need to stop here. Yeah. We're not going to get any discussion as Ooh, it is. That's right. It's, it's uh, 11 30. Uh, 30 minutes, 11.30, and I know some of you have to go elsewhere, but uh, for those of you who can stay, we're going to give you a chance to ask some questions. I just want to point out a couple of things, uh, if I can use the chalk here. Uh, there are several different views of the universe, and they need to be carefully distinguished. Um, one of them is this bowl with the flat earth underneath it. Okay. One of them is a three-layered universe, or perhaps a five-layered universe, depending on, you know, Babylonians apparently had that kind of concept. Interestingly, they didn't have the bowl, which is fascinating. And then you could, of course, have uh, uh, the underworld, whatever that is, down underneath here. Uh, waters under the earth. Uh, Sheol, maybe. Um, then there is a flat earth, but with a sphere around it. And that's a little harder to put the waters of chaos outside. There is the round earth with the sphere around it. And then there is the round earth going around the sun with the sphere around it. And finally, there's what's probably the most modern one, the round Earth with the round sun with galaxies off in the distance. And um, it seems to me that the only problem that you really have translating is when you have the bowl and the water's outside and every time you open the windows of heaven, the waters dump in. Um, and I just, I have a hard time getting that out of scripture. I do agree that the water's dumped in at the flood. But apparently other things can dump in and that's the only time the water's dumped in. And so I would rather say that God dumps in whatever he wants to rather than to say the waters are out there and you gotta have this thing holding them out. Well, and um, the, the problem again that we have which is what the whole book is actually about, is that we are attempting to impose scientific demands on an ancient text for a people who, for whom science would not yet separate itself from theology for about 2,000 years. And when God does everything, both uh, as we point out in, in uh, not this book, but another one, uh, their worldview, and this is where the explanacepts come in, their worldview was that God did everything that humans didn't do. And God did things routinely, which today we would say fall in the realm of nature. And God did things exceptionally, which likely today we would say fall into the realm of miracle. Now, now I may be the only one who feels this way, but I doubt it. Uh, I think there are a lot of people who would agree with that. 
uh, that in fact God does things in the usual way and, and does then God does things in unusual ways uh, but it's all God yeah. and just because we can figure out what God's going to do doesn't mean that it isn't God doing it exactly and, and now, today we say that God works through nature one step removed because he set up nature and nature's laws well some of us think that he's actually doing it at a moment okay. by moment I do remember an Ellen White quote that kind of sounds that way. That is, um, although she talks about um, going along with the way that nature operates, she says we'll do a lot better and live a lot longer if we do. Now, if I may uh, borrow your microphone and let you guys share one, and uh, I'm gonna, uh, most of you ha can ask me questions anytime you want. I'd like to give them the lion's share of that, uh, of the questions. We have a couple of them back here. I have a question for uh, Dr. Fritz Guy. I used to be your student for many Sabbaths, and I highly respect your opinion. Uh, you made reference to the idea that Adventists, if I understood you correctly, that Adventists used to think, those Adventists who lived before 1960, used to believe that the universe was 6,000 years ago. Now, I grew up in Argentina, and Argentina is a third world country. Yet, I don't remember a single instance it's, it's of It's an enlightened Adventist. third world country. I'm sorry? It's a very enlightened third world country. Okay, thank you. But <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't recall a single Adventist believing that. Could that be also fiction like the flat earth well um, I, I, I won't deal with like a flat earth uh, as a fiction that's a, another issue but um, I was reflecting my own experience uh, having uh, gone through four years of academy education and four years of college uh, in an Adventist setting uh, I, I was uh, taught that everything, uh, now let's not worry about uh, what our friend Ellen calls the inhabitants of other worlds. We don't know where those worlds are uh, in this universe or some parallel universe or in some <coughs> other kind of realm, but uh, I certainly was taught by both scientists and theologians that the universe that we are aware of, our universe, uh, was a few thousand years old. Now, maybe Adventists in Argentina were simply farther, more advanced. Uh, I don't know. But to, to dilate on that just to, for a few seconds, uh, it was uh, largely the work of Dr. Robert Brown, a physicist who was the head of the Geoscience Research Institute, who uh, it was his work that sort of moved uh, a certain segment of Adventists uh, into a view that is sometimes called old earth, young life. That is that the matter of the earth uh, is old, and I suspect he was uh, I've not talked to him about this, but I suspect he was moved by uh, radiometric dating of various sorts, and that convinced him that the stuff, the matter of the earth is very old, uh, or at least a whole lot older than a few thousand years. Now, uh, let me be clear, nobody in my uh, adolescent and young adult education was willing to die for 6,000 years. That's why I use the term a few thousand, less than 10. But, uh, you know, because the, uh, the Septuagint gives a different number scheme and uh, of uh, how much, uh, about 7,500 7, 500. 7, 500 years, uh, so that, uh, you know, nobody's going to, as I say, die for 6,000. But the conventional understanding was a few thousand years for uh, what I now call the whole big enchilada, uh, which is a, uh, 
corrupt uh, English Spanish or English Mexican term. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to first uh, commend both of you for your honest attempt to try, to try to bridge the gulf between the Bible and science. I found the book uh, very helpful. And I also want to commend Paul for his fairness in inviting you here to hear your side of the book. Uh, one other curious uh, fact, uh, you've both written books. Paul, Paul has written this book, Scientific Theology. And uh, I noticed on the back of your book that uh, uh, you were a prof research professor of philosophical theology. I find it interesting that where, whereas you are a philosophical theolo theologian, that your book is more scientific uh, as far as modern science is That's concerned. That's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> more si your book is more scientific as far as modern science is concerned than Paul's, which, is, which he calls scientific theology, and in which he espouses uh, a young earth and six literal days which is not scientific as far as modern science is concerned. So I find that kind of uh, curious, uh, the, difference, the differences there. Well, I think uh, we've got a terminological uh, issue here. Uh, the term philosophical theology uh, refers to that branch of theology that is concerned with the kind of questions that philosophers ask. Uh, what is reality? Uh, what is knowledge? How do we know? How do we know that we know? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and in terms of reality, do uh, are numbers real? What kind of reality do they have? And, and so on. Uh, as for uh, Paul's use of the term scientific theology, maybe you need to give the microphone back to him. Uh, so I have the microphone anyway, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, so that he can, he can deal with that. Uh, very, very shortly, I use a method that's developed in science to work in theology. At least that's what I'm trying to do. And, uh, and that's why I call it scientific theology. Not so much, although I do try to deal with the scientific evidence, um, and I'm and, and certainly conscious of the uh, uh, scientific uh, consensus, if I can put it that way. Um, I'm actually, uh, I'm actually using a method that's supposed to be developed in science, in theology, and that's why the term scientific theology. Um, but, uh, and of course I know that there are always those who will say, well, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. And uh, like our colleagues here, I think that I'll have to say that I'm, there are some places that if I were writing the book today, I would change it. Uh, but. Uh, um, that's, uh, uh, you know, we, um, whenever you put your thoughts down to paper, that's something that you do, but uh, it, is, it was an attempt to use a scientific model uh, in dealing with theology. We, we have a couple of other, okay. let me go Hi. ahead and make yeah. it real short. Yes. Um, I like to think, uh, at least it seemed to me, that the, <coughs> that the book's emphasis on the dome and the flat earth and so on, um, while you can read that into there and while that was um, a view of many for thousands of years, I think that God wrote the Bible through the prophets not verbal inspiration, but idea inspiration, person inspiration. He wrote it in a way that he knew we living today could accept Genesis 1 literally, not the dome idea, because that was something that, well, when I was a child, my father would tell me stories about Mr. Tuberculosis and Mrs. Tuberculosis germ, who you know, went into the, these big long tunnels and set up housekeeping. I mean, I don't reject that story as untrue today, but I have outgrown it. But still it had the seed of truth in it. Genesis 1 was not a complete scientific explanation, but it is not 
out of the truth is progressive and we should be able to read Genesis the way it is really true today according to modern science including a literal six days and a literal seventh day Sabbath otherwise we're going to be getting into problems with who really is Jesus Christ when did he come to this earth and why and sin the fall what about the suffering of animals for billions of years or millions of years if we don't accept a six-day creation and the atonement it, there are many things that are left unsettled if we throw out six-day literal creation and the Bible really is Genesis 1 really is large enough flexible enough to accept the 13 and a half billion year age back then but then a literal recent creation I appreciate that uh, summary and would um, like to respond I'd like to respond by quoting from um, uh, one of the pages of the book. The, the problem that we get into, as you're, I'm sure, fully aware of, is that if we don't come up with some coherent way of interpreting Genesis, literal or figurative, we don't know which parts of it to do what with. And so let me read here. It's in the uh, heading entitled Literal or Figurative. And I'm just going to read one paragraph. Because we now hear Genesis 1 with four explanatory concept minds and ears. And we talk in the book about how when Genesis was first heard, the people who heard it had two explanatory concepts. They had God who did everything including nature. Uh, and then they had human beings. Well, they had demons too, but that was in the realm of God. So. We now hear Genesis 1 with four explanatory minds and ears. We know the sun does not revolve around the earth. For us, the heavenly bodies are in the explanatory concept of nature. And we do not require the explanatory concept of God to understand their motion. For us, that's in the realm of mathematics and physics. What was literal for the first listeners is figurative for us. This change from a literal to a figurative understanding is must by the fact that we still refer to the sun as rising and setting, that is, moving around the earth. The rakia itself, however, remains a problem that nothing can mask. The waters beneath it and the waters above it are a problem. God fixing the sun in it is a problem. Its windows are a problem. The Genesis text says that the greater light and the lesser light were set in the rakia. That's uh, the, it's very difficult to get around the fact that the sun and the moon are set in the rakia according to the story. Its windows are a problem. The first material thing that God created, God created light first, but the first material thing that God created, the rakia, which the first listeners of Genesis 1 understood literally, we today either interpret figuratively or ignore entirely. I mentioned the little study I did, and most people can't bring firmament or vault to mind when they think about Genesis chapter 1. The rakia as such we usually ignore. Its waters above and its windows we interpret figuratively. In no way can we now understand it literally as it was understood by that first Hebrew audience. So was Genesis 1 science? Well, yes. As close to our category of science as a two explanacept world of Genesis 1 could allow. Science is, after all, an attempt to understand and explain the world around us. Was Genesis 1 theology? Yes, as close as the available means of explaining the incomprehensible creative acts of God would allow. Was it understood as a true narrative of how, by the activity of God, everything came into existence? Absolutely, it was that too. It explained the origin of everything, the originator of everything, and the place of humanity in the grand scheme of everything. It was, and still is, the inspired, true, and essential account of what happened in the beginning to produce the reality experienced by the original hearers and by us today. That is why we call it Genesis.
which of course means beginnings. Uh, I would like to, to uh, plug in here because I think it fits. Uh, something that uh, Ellen White wrote in 1901. Um, this is letter 121. It's available in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 22. The Lord speaks to human beings in imperfect speech in order that the degenerate senses, the dull earthly perception of earthly beings, that's us, may comprehend his words. This thus is shown God's condescension. He meets fallen beings where they are. The Bible, perfect as it is in its simplicity, does not answer to the great ideas of God, for infinite ideas cannot be perfectly embodied in finite vehicles of thought. I think that raises, uh, well, it reminds us to be modest and humble and never too sure that we have the mind of God all figured out. Um, God, the Lord, speaks to human beings in imperfect speech. Perhaps we should say even that we have to be careful we may not have the minds of the ancients figured out either. Oh, that's true. That's true. And uh, one of the things that has happened in the 19th century is a legend grew up and metastasized all over that spread this idea that there was a dome and there was the earth and that goes back as far as anybody can trace. And it's just not true. Well, we have the text of Genesis. To that we would appeal. Perhaps we should deal with that in, in some length at, a, at another session. Language is incredibly subtle. When I hear the word vault, I think of a burial vault or a bank vault, something with thick walled, confined space. What do you intend I should see visually when I hear you use the word vault? The dome of St. Peter's in Rome, viewed from the inside. Um, in reference to the quotes that have been mentioned by Ellen White, uh, first in the foreword about how we need to be open-minded and be thinkers, and then also um, to the quote that you just shared, I'm just curious as to, um, in addition to those quotes, um, in your scientific research and in the conclusions that you draw, how do you, um, how, what role has the spirit of prophecy played and particularly her writings, in the more specific um, things that she has to say about her understanding of the creation account and um, in what could be considered a more historical Adventist perspective. There is no question but what Ellen believed that the whole visible universe came into existence a few thousand years ago, a view which neither the Geoscience Research Institute, nor the Biblical Research Institute currently endorses. Now that's, those are facts. Uh, I, there is no question but what Ellen, as a child of her time, she could hardly have thought anything else. Uh, sure, there were ideas of, of long evolutionary ages and so on, but uh, as far as uh, her world was concerned, uh, she believed what, what was uh, believable and, uh, and not something else. Uh, so, uh, but you have raised a very interesting question uh, for which I have a short answer which is therefore certainly inadequate uh, to the significance of the question. I take Ellen White more seriously in the principles that she enunciates than in her specific interpretations of particular verses. Indeed, in some cases, she interprets the same verse differently at different points. But, uh, I th and I think the same is, is true for our reading of scripture. I think uh, for example, to get into a current ecclesial political issue uh, uh, regarding um, the equal ordination of women in ministry, Paul's 
statement, in Christ there is neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ. I think that's more important to us at this point than his specific instruction uh, to uh, the women in a particular congregation, whether it was Ephesus or Corinth or wherever, uh, and how they should behave in a specific situation. I think general principles are always more significant for us in a different time and place uh, than uh, specific interpretations, whether it is of, of reality or a problem or whatever. Uh, well, we've talked about science and pre-scientific pre era and various things, and um, it, it seems to me you haven't really considered one possibility, and that is that, that God really did uh, convey inspired understanding to Ellen White and to, to whoever wrote Genesis, uh, and that we, we're, we're missing something. We don't understand it because we're missing something. And it really is more specific and more literal than, than we, we like, than contemporary scientific understanding would like to have it. That, uh, you, you raise an, a very appropriate caution. Remember that science can never prove anything. All science, science is actually a methodological approach to understanding physical reality. And it is definitely the case that what we understand today about, say, the age of the Earth, the dimensions of the Earth, the dimensions of the universe, et cetera, all of those things are subject, they're corrigible. They could be changed. And at one point in the book, we, we draw this caution. We point out that for a group of people who exist at a time in history, when science has acknowledged that we only know about 4% of what exists out in the universe, the rest being dark energy and dark matter, what we see and play around with is, is, is less than 10% by a wide margin of what's out there, that it would it'll behoove us to be sure of anything. So I, I agree entirely with what you said. However, um, we have to at least draw tentative conclusions in order to proceed to do experiments. I uh, tease my friend here, Fritz Guy, theologians. Theologians can hold two... Contradictory? Completely contradictory ideas in their head. They even have a term for it. They call them antinomies. Um, when I go to the laboratory, I've got to pick one or the other to design my experiment, as you do. You can't design an experiment uh, and <laughs> pursue something in science by adopting two mutually contradictory ideas as the basis for your research. So he has, he has privileges that I don't. But what you say is absolutely true. Science, everything that science now claims to be true is corrigible. It can be changed, and in all likelihood, it probably will be. And our interpretations of scripture, according to the quotation you read earlier, are similarly corrigible. There is no excuse for anyone in taking the position that there is no more light to be revealed and that all our interpretations of scripture are without an error. Um, um, you, you as a theologian can say that. I as a scientist cannot. But You, you can read that. Uh, one time Mrs. White was writing a letter about a fire next door. Her neighbor's barn or something was on fire. And uh, then she, you know, went from describing the burning building to the fires of hell and the destruction of the wicked. And then she went on to say, if I'm talking about just common ordinary things, like a house burning down, barn burning down, that's not inspired. That's not the prophet's writing there. But if I'm talking about something for the benefit of the church, that the church needs, like the theology, she didn't use the word theology, of instruction for the church, uh, what happens to the wicked, and so on. That is inspired, has to be considered part of the prophet's role. And I think the same thing could be a dividing line in science, that um, 
whether it's 13 billion years ago that the raw materials of this earth were put on board in the universe, or 6,000 years ago, does not affect our relationship to Christ or sin or salvation, the basics of the Bible, and that to me is, is the dividing line. Uh, if the 13 billion years start, started going over into evolutionary processes of life, uh, then you'd get into suffering of the animals and, and pre-humans and all that, and where do you fit in Eden and, and the fall and so on. So I think that it is possible to pick and choose as a scientist what is truth. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a good read. Um, on page 163, you define two, three different um, species of evolution. And each of these embodies a various uh, thought or idea um, that we see in our culture or society today. Um, on page 164, just the following page, you say that um, that this E3 or um, that uh, or does Genesis 1 say anything about evolution in reference to E1 or 2 and you say it's clearly no and I was thinking about the processes um, and how Peter, Isaiah, um, Paul, uh, John the Revelator, Moses, Jesus make specific reference to the creation story found in Genesis and give it a specific reference in which it would refute the very claims of the traditional scientific forms of evolution as traditionally understood. In Genesis 1 and 2, when it implies that God made are you implying that God made, making is the same as creatures evolving new body plans and organ systems? What are the phrases, God spoke, God fashioned, formed from a rib? These ideas are in direct contradiction to the currently proposed theories found in evolution as are stated in forms one and two in your book on page 163. One of the things that um, we haven't gotten into, but I appreciate this question because it uh, allows for at least a brief exploration of that, okay. is that um, in, in an earlier book that Fritz and I put together, we um, enjoined people not to place scientific demands on an ancient text whose authors had so no such thing in mind. And at the time, frankly, both of us thought that it was possible to read a description of things that today we would call science or nature, of material reality, of 3,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago and bring it forward and understand it in our modern age. After further consideration, we decided that we were probably wrong, that it is likely impossible to bring forward an idea or a concept about physical reality, what today we would call science, from that age to this one and have it make sense to us. Let me illustrate. Um, their, uh, their picture of the earth, as we've mentioned, appears to us from the text itself to be one of a created reality inside a protective dome with the waters of chaos uh, the abyss, with which Genesis 1 opens, there's water everywhere and darkness over the face of the deep. It's impossible to bring that forward and make sense out of it in a scientific world, because if we bring it forward, it has to fall into a category that didn't exist at the time that it was written. And that category is nature and nature's laws. Let us remember that Genesis was not addressed to us. If it had been, it presumably would have been written in English. 
and it would have incorporated the ideas that we have of science, what science is supposed to, is supposed to be able to investigate. Genesis was not addressed to us. Now, I'm not saying that it is not profitable for us to read it, but when we read it, what we have to do is go back there, and that's why the retro-translation process. We have to go back there, we have to strip our minds of our default explanation for scientific things, which we today consider to be explained either by nature or nature's laws or accident, because neither of those concepts were present back then. So what we have to do is we've got to go back there, look over their shoulders, listen to, along with them, to the story of beginnings, abstract from that principles which apply to them and apply to us, and bring the principles forward. We can't bring their understanding of the, of the world of reality directly into our world, because if we do, we end up with all sorts of peculiar and odd things. So Genesis was not addressed to us. We can look over their shoulders with great profit, but when we do that, we have to look over their shoulders thinking about those things the way they thought about them, abstract the principles, and that's what we're trying to do in the book, and bring the principles forward into our modern scientific age. I think I, I, also it's absolutely crucial to re realize and then remember that the function of Genesis 1 is to tell us about God, to tell us that God is the source of all reality. There is only one God who is responsible for everything, including some of those entities that were worshipped as God by the peoples around the ancient Hebrews, uh, the sun and the moon, for example. Uh, Genesis 1 is, uh, to the, well, uh, I guess we deal with this, Brian, uh, somewhere toward the end of the book. Uh, it is more theology. For us, it is theology rather than science. It is telling us about the meaning of our lives. There is a sense in which, with all due respect, uh, we can live with the possibility that there has been life on Earth for millions of years. How and when life began and developed, like how and when the universe began and developed. Those are interesting scientific questions. The fact that underneath all of this is a living, loving God makes all the difference. That we cannot afford to lose. That's the message of Genesis 1. How we will bring our scientific knowledge, or what do we call I guess we call it knowledge if it's the best we can do with the evidence we have. Uh, how we bring that to bear. And it is interesting that people who say they just read the Bible, nevertheless, now have begun to read Genesis 1-1 in the light of radioactive dating, and a lot of cosmology and the Big Bang and so on. They have no trouble uh, bringing science to bear on their understanding of Genesis 1-1. When some of these same people get to Genesis 1-2, they then interpret, indeed, a few years ago, a prominent Adventist biblical scholar claimed that the word Earth in Genesis 1-1 one, Eretz, uh, has a totally different meaning from what the same word means in Genesis 1, 2. And when you remember that initially there weren't any verse divisions, uh, that's a, a, cur a curious development. A totally different scientific meaning. Yeah, that, that, that has a, a totally different uh, yeah, scientific application. So 
Um, it seems to me our job is to figure out how best to correlate what we know about the world, nature, and so on, with what we know about God. And clearly, Scripture is our primary source of information about God because it is our primary source of information about Jesus of Nazareth, who was, we are convinced, the human embodiment of divine reality, particularly the values and attitudes uh, of ultimate reality, namely God. I, I want to interject at this point. Um, I think there's a mistake to say that it's theology and science that really what we're dealing with is history. What actually happened, and maybe it wasn't scientific, maybe it didn't follow the usual rules of nature. And that's, that's a, uh, I think that's a possibility we have to lay, leave open. If we don't leave that possibility open, then the usual rules of nature dictate that bodies do not resuscitate. Mm -hmm. And the resuscitation of Jesus, the resurrection, has to go by the wayside as one of those stories that people just kind of understood, but, you know, they were benighted back then, and so, uh, which really bothers me because one of the things that we're seeing in this whole thing is the growth of, if I can call it that, an anti-clerical, certainly, and actually by the time it ripened it was anti-dogmatic theology, uh, bias in history that was so bad that it could obliterate facts that everybody knew beforehand. And that means that we have to view this kind of thing with suspicion. Beyond that, if intelligent design <coughs> is remotely correct, and I think there's good reason to believe it is, then the, then the scientific establishment has that same kind of blind spot. And it is not fair to say, well, we're objective and you're not, and therefore, you know, we don't have to listen to you. I, I am trying to open some room there for thought because I think that it has been shut off too, lo too often Amen. in secular graduate schools. Oh, that may, that may well be. Uh, but open to thought is exactly the point. I think we got one here. The lady is next. Uh, we'll get her next. Just want to say my, the bottom line with me and Ellen White, uh, you can say all you left. about her being a person of her time. Uh, we could say that about a lot of the prophets, um, for instance, is that when she talks about um, creation and the literal week, at least in the, I don't know about if it's in Patriarchs and Prophets, but in the Spirit of Prophecy, I believe, volume, she said, I was shown that the first week was just like every other week since then. And uh, if I'm going to believe that Ellen White was God's messenger and that he, she was inspired of God, uh, and I firmly do, of course, is, is obvious, <laughs> then I accept. I, that is my bottom line. She was shown these things. And uh, as far as the Bible being that it wasn't written for us, I just heartily disagree with that because God is the <laughs> ultimate author of the scriptures. He, knew, he saw, he sees the end from the beginning and he knew that we would be here to, at the end of time to need these things, so. Did you believe that I said the Bible wasn't written for us? No, you said Genesis 1 wasn't. No. It no. wasn't. Addressed to us. Ad okay. Makes all the difference. Well, it sounds like 
your reasoning is saying it wasn't written for us. Uh, no, 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 no. To no, understand. We have to go back. Remember that the inspiration, the authority of the text inheres in the occasion on which it was given. We've talked to you at great length here about translators and their tendency to do what they think is appropriate with the text. We are, as English speakers, um, limited to translations. We're also limited to concepts that we may have that they didn't. The inspiration of the text comes from the original occasion on which the inspired prophet spoke to the audience to which it was addressed. Well, I guess your, your, inter your in translation, I don't see that it, could, it does, cannot mean a literal, just, I mean, it's not that different from uh, the, in, well, what we've been reading in the King James or whatever. But I think the, my main point was about the Ellen White. Um, she said, I was shown. And that, that's convinced me. Let me illustrate. So I, I don't care what anybody else says. She, well, she was right. <laughs> Uh, inspiration may not be identical with ultimate infallibility. I don't know what that means. Is it here? I do have a quick oh, question, okay. but first I'd like to just make one you know I'll just small comment. Over. I, and I don't understand why you said it the way you did, but I don't think I completely agree with my understanding of the scripture, not just from Genesis, but from all of it, is one that does not leave room for any death prior to the fall. So I don't understand how we could say that there could be millions of years of animals prior to the creation week. So I'll just make that just general comment. I just happen to disagree. My main question, though, would fall more under your, you've, you've talked extensively about the word rakia and how there's this controversy that can't be uh, explained about it. I think, from what I'm understanding, the information in Genesis is more of a, it, from even what you said in some of the writings that you, you said in the book, it was more of a hymn talking about the, um, the creation of the planet. And I also understand from, not only from listening to you, but from other people that Hebrews, or the Hebrew language is not as detailed as our language. So there may have been a lot of uh, underlying connotations with some words. Is it possible that rakia is a perfectly acceptable term and that we could figure something out for it that would be completely compatible with our understanding, but because we're trying to put it into the context of a very specific English. We seem to see a controversy where there may not be one. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just trying to think out loud a little bit here. So please excuse me. I, I am trying to grasp everything that you guys have been uh, expressing. So, thank you for the comment. It's um, it's a very interesting question, and yes, there is the possibility that um, Rakia refers to something. Uh, that, that it doesn't refer to dome or vault and it doesn't refer to uh, atmosphere, it refers to something else. Um, we have to do the best with what we've got and one of the underlying guiding principles of retro translation is to take the author's explicit statements as, um, as gospel, if you will, that's uh, mixing my metaphors here, but if the author defines a word, then we go with that definition. And in the book, we explain what the rules are. If, if the author doesn't define the word, then we use um, what the way the word is, is employed in the rest of the Pentateuch. And if we can't find it there, we go to the rest of the Old Testament. And if we can't find it there, we go to the whole Bible. So we do our best to understand what each of those Hebrew words meant to the author and the author says explicitly that he created the rakia to separate the waters with which the Genesis uh, account begins. 
Most of us think that God created ex nihilo, right, out of nothing. And that is indeed a very valid and I think totally appropriate theological concept. It's not present in Genesis. In Genesis, the creation story begins with something there, water and darkness. And so if you're going to begin with water and darkness and you're going to create a land fit for human habitation, you're going to have to protect it in some way. So that looks to be what Rakia is talking about and it's very important as we've mentioned, it is the noun most frequently used other than God during the cosmological portions of the Genesis account. Now, it may mean something else, and we may uh, come across a clay tablet from Babylonia or somewhere else which gives uh, a hint as to what it might have meant. But for the moment, that's the best we can do. other forms of water. So I guess what I'm saying is could the water that Rakat Rakia is referring to also be in different forms than what we would normally say? Sorry. Um, the, the question was could the, we understand the word water to mean many different things and is it possible that the way in which it's used in Genesis would give us a water for which the the beaten out metal dome thing was not necessary to protect against? And the answer is yes, but we can find no hint of it in the text. And uh, to our knowledge, nobody has come up in the 2,000 years or 3,000 years uh, since the, the text came into existence with some alternate. But yes, it could per mean perhaps, something different. Perhaps that's a subject for another day. Oh. If you guys are willing to come back. <laughs> oh. In theology as well as science, we must go on the evidence we have, not on the evidence we can imagine or wish we had. So uh, it, with all of this, we're doing our best to come to terms with the evidence, all of the evidence uh, we know. And by the way, uh, we, uh, the book was not intended to tell anybody what he or she should believe. It's intended to be a contribution to the conversation. Uh, for what it's worth, and again, this is kind of narcissistic, you may not care about our, our history on this, but we had originally intended to write a book for, the, for a general Christian audience, but as the months and a couple of years went by, it became clear that, that these issues regarding natural history and the age of life and so on uh, were becoming increasingly uh, controversial, increasingly bothering people. So uh, we decided to make it a more Adventist book as a contribution to the conversation. If anything that is in the book is helpful, we are pleased. If it's not helpful, we're sorry. Um, but we have tried to to say some things that we that we found helpful, to share some ideas that, that we found helpful as we have each in our own way wrestled uh, with these issues. So we don't expect everybody to agree. Uh, and we don't even expect everybody to be happy. Uh, we, it wasn't our goal to make everybody happy. Uh, we are not comedians, as far as I know. And uh, <laughs> not, that's right, we may be ridiculous sometimes, but we're not intentionally comedic. Uh, so anyway, uh, for what that's worth, uh, that's where we were going. And we wanted to uh, try to offer a different perspective on issues that have, have been troubling to a great number of our fellow believers. Uh, one comment, uh, Dr. Fritz. 
which I believe the other two ladies alluded to, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't tell me that the scriptures give a reason for Christ and our focus on him and then turn around and say that, that we had death and dying before the fall which led to the need for a Christ. You can't have it both ways. You, gotta, you can't say that the scriptures are wonderful to tell us about Christ and how important he is and yet gut the full theology behind why Christ did the sacrifice, which your conversation earlier, I think, did. And so that's, that concerns me. I understand the issue of the, the there was a void here and that how, how long the material stuff exists. But when you get to the point that you stretch out the, to, to accommodate the current thought of evolution, stretching out the time periods that you have, essentially the effects of sin before sin occurs or there is ev evidence that sin occurs and therefore we have to have a, a savior for that sin. We have a, I have at least, a difficulty tying those two together and then glossing it over by saying, but the rest of scriptures tell us how important Christ is because I just took the foundation right out from underneath my limited understanding of the theology of why he had to do the sacrifice. Uh, granted, uh, for Certainly for any Adventist, uh, you have articulated a very important issue. The fact that, and it is a fact, that a long history of life on earth can be understood in compatibility with general Christian belief in the person and function of the nature and work, the way theologians often talk about it, of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, this is put together by millions of Christians around the world. So it's a little difficult to say that it can't be done, that it is difficult for an Adventist. Uh, sure, uh, that's, that's true. Uh, and uh, they're, they're this, I'm not sure that this is a matter on which we will all agree uh, this side of the second advent. Uh, you know, because we, we are different and we see things uh, differently. I have a question for Brian Bull. Uh, Brian, I have listened to your teachings for, on many occasions and I highly respect the effort you have made to help us. Now, maybe you can help me today. Suppose I accept long ages. What will that do to the final events of history? If God needed millions of years to create one man how long will it take for him to resurrect millions of men? How long did he need to resurrect Lazarus? How millions of years did he, did he take to resurrect Lazarus? And Paul says that sin and death came through Adam. And that's why Jesus came to save us from the result of sin. So, I have a serious problem. At the same time, I understand your argument, but should we subject the teachings of the Bible to science? How long did it take for Jesus to turn water into wine? What the science says about that. In other words, we know from nature that it now. takes many months to produce wine from water. Jesus did it in a split second. And Paul says that the resurrection of the just will be in a blinking of an eye. Should I discard that and believe that God is not powerful enough to do what he did? I have a serious problem. I respect, now the question was for Brian, but Fritz Guy, if you want, Dr. Guy, if you want to respond, that's 
Fine. You, I thought it was a scientific question, but the longer you went on, the more it became apparent that you were, um, you were drifting into the realm of theology. The, in the book, by the way, we don't talk about age of the earth or anything. Uh, we are simply dealing with the text of Genesis, and you may have noticed that Genesis doesn't say how old the earth is. It certainly doesn't say it's 6,000 years. Now, I'll concede that if you want to say what is the impression that it conveys, it, the impression that it conveys, but it's an impression, is that the earth isn't enormously old and that life hasn't been around for a great period of time. There are no dates, unless, of course, you wish to use the, uh, the, um, the dates that are given for the genealogies, and as you are, I'm sure, aware, now that's highly controversial, and there are many reasons to believe that that's an inappropriate way for determining uh, anything. But the Bible itself doesn't say how old. It just says, in the beginning, uh, uh, God created the heaven and the earth. I'm not, and for, I'm not, I'm not trying to defend 6,000 or 10,000 or 15,000 or 20,000. I'm just leaning towards young life. The year could be 5 billion years. The universe could be, actually I believe the universe is probably trillions of years, not 13.5 or 7 billions of years. So my position <coughs> is slightly different from what you understood for me to be. Uh, two, two comments uh, then. Uh, taking your last comment first, uh, last the, the narrative of Genesis 1 uh, does not suggest uh, that kind of, of distance between the origin of the matter and the, uh, and the beginning of life. Uh, that's a, a version of the gap theory, uh, which uh, that fact doesn't prove anything at all. Uh, but I'm just saying I, I don't think the text will support that. But going back to your, your initial comments, the question is not what could God do? Did God need? Neither you nor I have a clue about what God needs. We just don't know that much about God and probably never will. Uh, but So the question isn't what did God need? The question is what did God do? How did it happen? Uh, to the extent that that is uh, an appropriate kind of question, whether how it happened is a theological question or a scientific question, probably has implications in both directions. But uh, generally, uh, I don't find any, uh, I don't know anyone, even those who insist that they read Genesis 1 literally, I don't find anyone arguing that the, the land and the sky came into existence before the sun, moon, and stars, which is clearly the way the story is told. And for young earth creationists, that is, and I quote here, uh, a prominent Adventist creationist whose name you would recognize, but he, I didn't ask him for permission to quote him, so I won't identify him. He said, yes, that's a problem. That is, the, uh, the events of the fourth day. If, uh, if the earth uh, goes around the sun, it's a little hard to imagine uh, the earth without a sun, but presumably there are ways to do that. I, I, w our time is up. I, I wanted to express on behalf of Fritz and myself thanks and um, gratitude to uh, Paul Geem uh, for this opportunity and to you for participating. It's been a pleasure for us to be here and, um, and thank you Paul for uh, uh, an enormously impressive gallop through our book. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you for coming. Uh, can we all give them a hand? And uh,
And uh, if you want to come back to go over the scriptures on Rakia, uh, you're welcome anytime. Thank you.